those people who are out there fighting just to make a living, just to pay their bills, we need to offer them products that are, that are gonna make them feel also better inside. Without that, they have to spend all this time researching, how do we do it? What's the transfer? What's the distribution? They don't have time for that. What they need is people like us to change the system. For the industries to say, okay, I mean, great, Friday's future, go out, scream, so that industries make a shift. All of us are doing our part and we're doing it together to, to simply reform the system. Eva Karatik is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. If there's one thing that Ava has mastered in the half century of her life, it is to embrace experience and create stories. Whether it be song or speech or trying to save the planet, she is a master in storytelling. She was at her first meeting with politicians, managing directors, and hoping, hoping to finance an innovative vertical farm facility run on 100% renewable energy, and they started off with a normal introduction round. In this introduction round, there were long and impressive things being said, education, degrees, pol political things in, in this meeting, and Ava was panicking. She was like, how do I introduce myself around all these superstars, politicians, and degrees? And then she decided to go with the best plan of action to tell her true self and her true story because she is a power prowl, a power woman. She has numerous long background of successful um, experiences throughout the world. She produced and performed six of her own albums, all of origi original music. And she's always followed her desires to express her life and stories with music and sharing them with the world. What most of you might not know is that Ava is my best friend. She probably doesn't even know that she's my best friend. Uh, since I moved to Hamburg, Germany, um, Ava and I got introduced by one of one of our mutual friends, Harold Neidhart. And from that moment on, it was we hit it off and we've had a great friendship and journey that's been unbelievable. We're going to touch on some of those journeys during our discussion talk about some of those experiences, but I mean true deep journeys and experiences that we've had. Some extremely funny, some extremely sad, I guess, or uh, eye-opening, and um, we're still on the journey. We're having a lot of experiences, and I'm excited because, honestly, this is the best podcast I probably will ever do that I've ever done because it's with my best friend, Ava. Uh, just, just to give you a couple tiny more little accolades about this wonderful woman. She is a, a member of the Humber Chamber of Commerce Committee for Innovation and Research, newly appointed in 2020 to 2021. And she is doing the Food Works Initiative. And we're going to talk about that as well. She's an ambassador for the Farm Food Climate Challenge for Project Together, also fairly new. Um, it's part of the social Open Social Innovation Hub of Germany. She is a successful TEDx speaker, also very new, 2020 in October in Kassel, Germany. Um, she is still, even though she listed that she's not, the creative director for Alohas Eco Center. Um, it's a uh, fully sustainable food uh, eco center and beverage production facility. She's a climate reality leader from Al Gore uh, and a mentor for Al Gore's climate reality project. And he is, as I mentioned before, a singer, a songwriter, composer, producer, released six albums, all written her original music, songs, and they are all fabulous. Uh, one of, uh, or I'll tell you a couple of her uh, albums, Imported, Bittersweet Sessions, Sky Wide Open, 
the 70s, 50-50, A to Z through Germany. So I, I could go on and on. Oh, one more thing. The Jam Plan Agency, which is she works with wonderful clients like Auto Group, Mondelez, Adida, Milka, on and on to do these, not only team building, but show them the power of coming together, composing, writing, singing, performing songs uh, that not, not only are just team building, there's a lot more experience and things that go behind that for people to reach moonshots, to be innovative, to think differently, to see diversity and, and organizations much different. It's a very powerful tool. Ava, welcome to the show. Mr. McClary. It's so, it's so <laughs> good. I'd love to meet this person. Sounds cool. <laughs> You are cool. You're, you're, you're my, you're my bestie. You're, I'm so glad that we could have this discussion and that you came on the show because we have a lot to talk about. So first of all, I want to catch my listeners up to speed a little bit, how, how we know each other and some of the journeys we've taken. Um, we were at Seeds and Chips in Milan, Italy, and saw Barack, President Barack Obama, uh, who we're both a big fan of. And not only was that cool in, in and of itself, but we met all sorts of other cool people. We partied together and ha had one very hilarious, for you, hilarious. For me, it wasn't very hilarious. Um, we went to one of these after, after celebration parties at Carrefour, which was one of the sponsors of Season Chips. And, and they obviously had a full open bar and doing this. And uh, Ava knows I'm not a drinker. And she's like, you got to try these Moscow mules. They're just fabulous. <laughs> and uh, we, we might get into that story later, but uh, there's a whole humorous thing. We went to Montenegro together to um, put Gorica to, um, and this is also very funny. It's a nudist resort. It was an all, all inclusive nudist resort. Thank goodness. I don't know if you saw anybody running around naked. I, I didn't, but uh, we had a whole crazy experience there, getting there, getting back, uh, planes, tickets, luggage, all sorts of crazy experience where you performed and did a jam plan in Montenegro. That was Fun. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. It was uh, uh, unbelievable. Um, we've we've met with political leaders. We've um, we we've met in Regent Haida and discussed with political leaders. We've had Tesla at meetings with political meters, uh, uh, leaders leaders uh, talking about the Aloha Eco Center, um, and on and on. But we have dinners together. We drink a lot of coffees together. We have have had super. Uh, wonderful um, discussions and experiences together. And I want to share a few of those and some of these journeys that, that, that we've taken together, especially some journeys that you've had where I am, haven't had the fortunate ability to always be there, but that have been some pretty big learning lessons for, for you as well. And uh, your, your development and growth, you're still doing amazing things. Uh, I want to bring all those out. Um, a, a, one last thing, Ava is, is I'm, I'm not bullshitting you. She is one of my good friends. This is one of the gifts she gave me on my birthday. It was a, a book that she did with, with pictures of our journeys. This is at Season Chips with nice words. Um, this is at the Al Gore's Climate Reality Leadership Training in Berlin, where Ava and I were both doing mentorship. This is in Montenegro at the jam plan. I'm crazy looking like, like a Yeti and, and on and on. And then one of my favorite gifts that she's ever given me is this beautiful terrarium that I have in my house. I look at it every day and it reminds me of her. And, and, and so hopefully I've portrayed not only what a wonderful person I have here in front of me um, and what a good friend she is, but also some of the stories and the adventures that we've had together. And so uh, enough taking the time from your podcast um, episode, to, but I, I want to really set the stage. People need to know who right, this wonderful start. person is. We can start with the, we can start with the story about how we met because it's such a cool story. Please, you know? would you, would you tell that? Okay. So, 
So, all right, so we get, get a little bit of a backup story, okay? Me, uh, empty nest, what am I gonna do with the rest of my life? Oh my God. And, um, and then I saw this movie, and I can't find the, the name of this movie, but it was a movie that was before the Syrian refugee crisis happened. Um, it was a documentary how um, this woman followed five men in Germany and their, their journey and trying to find a way to figure out how to, how to work and how to and live in a different culture. And, um, and at the time I thought, oh, it is so difficult. And I mean, the journey for me having to live in a different culture by living in Germany, leaving my family behind, leaving what I knew behind was kind of, I, I, just, I just felt so much with these, with these men that I thought we need to create a future for them. Like you go through these different phases when you're living in a different culture where you just don't know, you're not familiar with the pathway that you can necessarily go down. And so I thought we need to create a vertical farm in Hamburg where we can offer jobs and futures for them where they don't have to learn German perfectly because German is a really hard language. It was kind of like, oh, I have so many friends that are, um, I've been living here for years and really to master German, even if you're a lawyer and you want to work as a lawyer in German, it's a whole different level. So I thought vertical farming, do my research, vertical farming, and then Harold introduced me to you. And there you are. He's like, oh, you need to talk about Mark. Yeah, I need to talk to Mark about vertical farming. And so I went up to you, I'll never forget it. I was like, hi, my name's Ava. I'm looking into vertical farming. <laughs> and you just go, and you listen to my story, you know, like what I wanted. And I'll never forget when you said, we can do it. We can create the jobs, we can do it, but we're gonna to have to do it without a carbon footprint. And then you started going on with all of the different, the solar and the wind, and then the waste and the water and the reverse osmosis and gray water recycling. I just sat there looking at you going like, okay, okay, let's do it. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it, Mark. Yeah, uh, that, I remember that day very well. That was at the, in Hamburg at the uh, Future City Campus, Harold's Campus. It's a container campus um, full of art projects. And uh, they even at one time had a little bit of some, some farming things going on there. But it's about new mobility, art, and just kind of future thinking in different innovations and small startup type of a maker lab environment. And uh, s since then... Really, our, our friendship has just gotten stronger and stronger. You invited Harold and I uh, uh, over to dinner with your, with your family, and that's when I first met Demir and, and um, both of your daughters, um, Derry and Lissy. And um, it, it's just, I don't know, I, I hate to say it, it's been a love story ever since. I, I cannot get enough of you guys and the journey and the good coffees and dinners and, and meals and things that we've done and experienced together. And it's still going on. Uh, obviously, the, the pandemic has kind of uh, <clears throat> slowed down our role in, in some respects. But in many respects, um, for me and you both, uh, you know, a lot of the, the things that I mentioned in your, in your bio, they, they happened in 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Um, but you, you would, even before we met, you were doing these albums, you were doing songs, you were doing jam plan, you had um, performed, you know, with Richard Marx uh, and um, many uh, Vonda Shepard, Marius Miller Vesterhagen, and on and on. Anyway, you've, you've, you've really had some super performances. But when we were in Montenegro, um, I, and, and this before I get into the first question, um, there was some drunk Russians who were probably from the nudist area that came over. <laughs> and they were like, uh, play some, some other person, some celebrity song or whatever. And you're like, no, this is my concert. I'm playing my songs. These are all original. I wrote them myself. And I love that. You are such a power woman. And you're saying, I don't need to sing other people's songs. My songs are fabulous enough. And they truly are. Because I have out of my eyes, I can't. <laughs> I can't yeah. sing songs. I'm just not good at it. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I don't even think so. I've been to many of your concerts. I kind of become your stagehand crew, uh, crew member, st stage crew. Uh, help try to help with whatever I can. 
um, and, and support you because not only am I passionate about your music and, 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 and love what you do and your songs, um, but, but I've seen, you know, I think you sing one or two other people's songs. It's nice, but your songs are so much better and, and have so much meaning and depth and substance in them. But, but what my question really where I'm going is, so before you've, you've created all these things, you've, you've got into climate activism and a lot in, into food to really see the systemic problems in food. And then we were hit with this craziness, not, not only even before in 2016, I believe it was when this Oompa Loompa, this orange guy became president, you and I were on the phone like, what in the heck is going on with our world? What's happened? We were already in turmoil then. And then the inauguration of Black Lives Matter, now the pandemic lockdown, we're like, what's, what's the world coming to? And, and how, how do we deal and cope? And what I learned, uh, and, and this is leading to the question is, I was talking about all these things, prepare, have some resilience about food and climate and environment, what's coming, we need to start making some changes in our operating models, our operating systems around the world. And then the pandemic hit and my phone, my emails were just off the hook. People say, can you help us get back to work? Can you help us change our models? We didn't listen to you before. Can you help us fix this and, and get out of this into you know, a better future, one that, that continues to, to move forward, but in, a, in the other direction, uh, kind of a future-proof model. So my question to you is, in all this crazy time with all that experience and the things that you were learning, I see that, that you also got busier, but what did you see and experience? How have you weathered this craziness and what's happened from, from then to now? Oh, this craziness. Um, it's, it's super special, but I think that, I think that what it does is it sort of uncovers different layers of society and then it starts to uncover different layer, layers of yourself. You know, so you're, you're dished out, whatever it is that you're dished out in life, what are you going to make out of that? And I think that, um, you know, sort of in my journey in my midlife journey and trying to figure out who I was and where I wanted to go with who I had become, you know, I started this journey with you and trying to sort of spread the awareness about food reform and sustainable practices and, you know, soaking in everything that you were teaching me that I was learning along the way with everybody else. And I just feel that you, you get these, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, you sort of just keep collecting things along the way and then you decide, well, what am I gonna do with these things? So every day you wake up and you are faced with a choice. I can take these things that I've learned and go back to sleep and cry. I can read the news and, and, and follow the orange guy and scream, you know, or I can take what, you know, the minutes and the hours I have in a day and I can sort of focus on something that I believe in that's good. You know, that's that I feel that if I, you know, if I'm, I don't wake up the next day, I spent this day investing in this good and I call it it's kind of stupid but I call it green energy because I feel like the people that I've met along the way or the people I've been fortunate enough to meet along the way through you are part of this green energy um yeah like if you're if you're looking down at us in a, in a petri dish and we're all swimming around in the petri dish you know it's my favorite stupid petri dish thing but like there are different sections of the petri dish okay and the petri dish let it be even the planet like I want to swim, move, and keep this green energy green. And I call the whole Trump and the whole whatever doubt, fake, whatever, this old method, that's like my poop part, you know? That's brown, it's ugly. Who wants that? Nobody likes that color. Nobody likes that energy. I'm not swimming there. I'm swimming in the green. And that's just, that's what I do. So I'm super busy. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know you're you're absolutely super busy during this time. I have trouble to get a hold of you anymore. I mean, but also we're in a severe lockdown, so we're technically not supposed to be hanging out together, especially in Humbert's new lockdown. I'm but, in uh, quarantine right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
uh, uh, ne it never fails. So the, that uh, that's beautiful because it shows me that not only before you've had some res resilience, but you've also had some big learning lessons on, you know, it's even more present over the time we were like, these, these old systems are, are not working for us anymore. They're all very siloed or linear. We need to get into some new systems. Um, I mentioned some of the new ones that you're getting into some of the new projects. Uh, the, the biggest one is, you know, project uh, together and uh, the future farm Campus. Future food campus. Hamburg. Future food We're campus. Hamburg. The world. <laughs> tell, tell us about that. Uh, oh, okay. So, um, yeah, it gets a little bit confusing because there are a bunch of different players. But you planted the seed in me, obviously, way back when when I was looking into vertical farming. And um, when you when you said, yeah, if we do this, you know, and, and there were the benefits of why vertical farming, the 30 harvests a year, the, the water resources, the fact that, you know, um, all of these technologies that we have today, if we combine them, we can produce food without a carbon footprint. And I thought, geez, that sounds that sounds amazing. And then, you know, at these different conferences where we were, we met people. I mean, I remember you saying you met Kimball Musk and you're like, well, wait a minute, like you're doing the, you're doing the vertical farming, but why aren't you using solar energy? Like, and so for me, so much of what you were saying back then and, and the work that you were doing made so much more sense than, than what was actually happening in the food reform. And so I just jumped on that bandwagon. And then because climate reality and the whole Al Gore, um, I'll never forget when I was in Philadelphia and he was talking up there, super impressive by the way, I didn't realize Al Gore was such an impressive person until uh, I was at the climate reality project. And I thought like, sorry, I have to, I have to say this about him. I thought That's he was funny. gonna come out and be like, hello, Hello, nice to meet you and then leave and there'd be other people but he was out there on the stage he was for hours standing he gave a two hour you know his two hour presentation 450 slides. The first hour of that presentation was the most depressing horrible reality of of climate reality and climate change and then he shifted to positive. And, I, and then he said you need to take what you've learned from me and you need to shape it into your own story. And so what I took out of it was to leave the depressing part behind because nobody wants to be yelled at and nobody wants to be told what to do, especially old people. And so I just decided, no, we need to focus on innovations, on solutions. What do we have? How do we combine them? How do we make something you know, out of that? So when we look back, we go, wow, look what we did. Instead of, oh, geez, we should have done something. And so that's, that's kind of what I did. And yeah, so by taking those, um, um, the, you know, the knowledge that I learned about vertical farming, the knowledge that I learned about this sort of systems thinking, closed loop, loop circular economy systems, and then getting to meet all these really cool startups that were doing things in the way of precision fermentation and cultivated meat, which I found, I just found, I don't know why, but I find science so exciting and so positive and so sexy. And I know that scientists aren't necessarily the sexiest when they talk because they're like, well, we have to improve on the hypothesis and it goes, it's maybe a little bit long-winded, but um, I, I find it so fascinating. And I just decided I'm gonna take that knowledge from those people, from those sciences, and I'm gonna try to support them the best I can. How best to do it? Creating a future food campus creating a place like a co-op where we can house them. And it's not necessarily about, and this, you love this, what we produce, it's how we produce it. And that is the mission. So if we can, you know, you see these startups, they're all sort of struggling with these new, oh, where am I going to scale up? And, and where are the bioreactors, you know, the, the actual machinery? And well, I want to do it sustainably, like with your mission, we're like, I can produce sustainably. So we need to offer all of these new up and coming young people who want to produce things, they want to produce it sustainably, we need to offer them a place 
you know? And that's what we're hoping with the Future Food Campus. It's incredibly complex. But on top of it, along the way, we found out about regenerative, uh, you know, farming, which I have to say, it had to come also on board. So normally these technology worlds, they swim over here and it's like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna develop something with technology. And then there's the natural side of things like, oh, we're gonna like, you know, we're gonna support our biodiversity and we're gonna farm regeneratively. But my hope is to combine it because we need not only both, we, we need all of it. Regenerative organic farming outside of the city, supporting those people, those pioneers inside the city, opening up a world to these new technologies and offering up transparency, com consumer awareness. People can come in and they can go, wait, I can try mozzarella? from that was made and you know it's it's vegan it's made in a bioreactor with precision fermentation i'm going and then i can also buy products from my favorite farmer guy out on the field oh my gosh i'm buying that package and then i can try like cultivated meat i can eat meat because maybe i like meat i can eat meat but betsy the cow she's out there outside of the city grazing around and doing her thing and it's all good and it's all an ecosystem and so this is the dream this is the vision mark <laughs> Yeah. I, I love it. I love how you how you tell it. And, and um, I, I'm lucky to have been along uh, on the journey with you. And it's, uh, you keep referring to me, but it has nothing to do with me. It, it's all you. And it's the, the connections. It's because I, I mean, I think I'd, I'd given you my presentation probably four or five times. It wasn't until about the fourth or fifth time you're like, the light went on. You're like, oh, I, oh, oh, I, I. I get it. I understand there's the, oh, this connection is this systems view of life, this ecosystem where everything's really tied together. And, and it, it, in the beginning, it, it is for people, it's overwhelming. It's this complexity science and it's too much information. Like, oh my gosh, my head's going to explode. I just don't, but really everything that we do in our life is made up of complexity and many systems and we're dealing with it every day. It's too much that we've been uh, dumbed down. We've been given the, the short versions that without systems thinking or even the dumbed down version, the short version, the elevator pitch, the quick pitch, those will never solve human suffering in our global grand challenges because they're really so complex. And, and, two th uh, and part of our journey in 2018, really the whole world shifted to the systems view of life, uh, systems thinking approach to solving grand challenges. So we really sit at the cusp of, uh, of this change and movement because be even though it's an old way of thinking, it's you know from 1972, Donella Meadows and the limits to growth, but um, it really wasn't accepted. People didn't understand it. We were kind of more trying to give me the quick silver bullet, the short version until 2018, that shift really started to occur. I want to go a little bit deeper into uh, what you're working on, but also give some more insight because you're skipping over some, some things that I think are, 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 are very vital. So there's always this question of, and you had it at, when, when you're, you were getting ready to present at the uh, uh, embassy. Can you tell us again, that it was the German-Italian embassy or what was it? Yeah, yeah, it was the Italian embassy, right. Okay. Yeah, so and, um, I don't know if everybody's aware, but, but the, when you take, uh, when you participate in the Climate Reality Project, you, um, you, you, you get all these learnings, you have all these slides and all this information. And what they ask of you is then to, give speeches, to go out there and just share it with small groups, with bigger groups. And, and I can tell you, I've been on the stage in front of 30,000 people playing my songs. And I have been on, you know, I've been on the stage. Stage is not my, my worry, but um, there I was at the Italian embassy and I'm there again, I'm in this room with experts, with scientists, with professors at universities who've been in this field for a really long time. I came in from the side and it's not as if, I mean, I, I offer maybe something else, but it definitely, I was incredibly nervous about being on this stage. Um, but the thing that I realized about what I do is, or who I am and why it's important that I continue doing this is because 
there aren't as many people who are as enthusiastic as me about it. There aren't that many people that are like, did you know? You have to. And then, and then just sort of, I learn and then I share, but I get people sort of like awake in, 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 and again, not in the mean yelling at them kind of way, but in the, oh, if I could do that, then that would be great, you know? So I, 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 I transform my speech into like real solutions. Everybody, this is what you probably already do. Great for you. This is what you also could do. Like super simple. If you did, you know, like, uh, I mean, this is the one fact of, I mean, the, the resources that it takes for meat, okay? Simple fact, did you know? We need 15,000 liters of water for one kilogram of meat. So that's equal to, did you know, six months of showers. When you tell people that, it kind of clicks and they're like, oh, I had no idea. Well, why they don't drink that much water, you know? And then you just say, no, it's the food that we have to feed the cow for them to grow. And in order for you to have that steak on your plate, it's just think about the system. Think about where, where your food came from. Think about where your food is going. And then realize that we're all part of the system. We're all living creatures on this planet, a part of a system. And in a kind of a nice way, sort of open up their minds to those thoughts, you know? And so, yeah, at the Italian embassy, I, it was great. And then I met Eco Elf. They were doing a presentation there too. And even though that's kind of, it's uh, about fast fashion and they were um, that great company, uh, one of the first companies that started taking plastics out of the ocean and, and tires and fishing nets out of the oceans and making beautiful products out of that. And from there, I also supported them and wrote a song because I was very inspired. You know, give me a little inspiration, I'll write a song. <laughs> You know, that, 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 that's a fabulous journey. I, I, I kind of want to go even more and then we're going to back up just a minute. So um, there's this feeling and that doesn't just occur in you. It's occurred in me. It's occurred in others. You're like in this room of experts, politicians, people that you've somehow put it on a different pedestal or or you think, OK, well, there it's them and us or they're different or why am I here? They're, they're, and I don't know if there's just one term for it, but you're like, well, what makes me able to speak about this? And I, and I kind of want to bring a little bit of that out, it, it, what your journey there has been of, about thinking that. And uh, not, because you, like you said before, you sang in front of concerts of big audiences. Uh, so that's not the problem. It's about something else. Why wouldn't you? at those meetings feel like, yeah, no, that's fine. I can talk about food. I can talk about the climate. How did that transition happen? Or what aha moments did you have there that maybe could help the listeners to say, oh, well, I haven't gone to a climate reality training or I haven't done this. And so how, how could I start advocating for the environment or be an activist? I can tell you, um, everybody, if, the, if, if people see me on stage, okay, I always love this because like my friends will be that go to a concert and then after the concert, like, oh my gosh, it was great. You did great. I loved it. It was exciting. And then I, and then, and I crash, okay. I crash after every single concert, every single, every time, because it's not that I'm nervous. I'm just, my adrenaline, I want to be the best I can be. I want to be as truly authentically me as I can be. And, um, and I make mistakes. I, uh, I am a, a master of making mistakes and I am a summation of my mistakes. But the, the fact is, those are sort of the things, the mistakes and the risks and all of those things that were sort of hard for me are the things where I grew the most, you know? And even though from the outside, it may look easy to put yourself out there, it's never easy to put yourself out there. There are always those voices in your head saying, why are you doing this? I mean, it's it's a perfect example through my A to Z. I, I assure you, um, I don't know if you want me to tell that story, but- um, I do, I do. That I think uh, also at this, this time, uh, when I turned 50, I had this big concert and uh, we, had, we had a really, I had worked on an album that was called 5050 because I had done half the album was really rocky and sort of heavy music and the other half was really slow and normally you're not allowed to put that kind of music together on an album but um, Fontaine Burnett who's my music guy he's like why <laughs> just do what we want to do and so 
So we we did this, we worked on this whole album and then we did the concert and it was this great concert. And then I thought, now what? I've done all these albums. They all had concepts. They've all been stories out of my life, whatever growth period, whatever it is I was going through, whatever my friends were going through. I turned them, all of those stories into songs, you know? But there's so much more involved with being a performer, as you know, with what you do. It's literally, it's coming up with um, the concepts for the album, coming up with the songs for the album, producing the songs for the album, getting the bands together for the, getting the events, inviting the people, doing the press thing, doing the photos, you know? And then you, I'm literally doing my website, doing videos, doing uh, social media. I mean, I cannot even tell you how much work, literally 95% goes into something besides songwriting. And the best thing that I can do is write a song. That's just that I, I know that whatever, I'm gonna be freaking 55. I can tell you right now, the thing that I do best is write, is writing songs. So then I thought, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna go play my songs. I'm gonna do something that's gonna take myself out of my comfort zone. Why? Because I don't want every day to be predictable. The thing that I loved about life or the thing that I love most about life, I don't know if everybody's like this, but it's not knowing what's gonna happen in a day. Okay, so by the end of the day, we're like, wow, that was really cool. What happened today? Like, just because I just don't know. And so I thought, well, how can I do something really unpredictable? How can I take myself out of my comfort zone? It's not making another album. It's not doing the same process. You know, that's, that's not going to take me out of my comfort zone. That's what I do. So I thought I'll play on the streets by myself because Generally, I'm a pretty shitty guitarist and um, I use it to write my songs, but I'm not like, you know, Pat Metheny. And I have my band usually to like support me. They've always got my back. Um, but I said, okay, do this. And how we do, go to places you've never been. So, so then I thought, whew, I'll go, to, I'll go to cities I've never been, but how, there's so many. I'll go alphabetically, A to Z. And I tell you, I'm driving into, and I know I've told this story before, but I'm, I'm serious. I'm driving into Ashabag. It's my first, my A city. And my, the voices in my head are screaming, Ava, why? Why are you doing this? Go have a coffee. Stop, you know? But then I just like, no, no, you have to like fight through this. You can do this. Found a place, played and felt like such an idiot. Nobody wanted me being there. Nobody knows my songs. Um, and so every city was kind of that, that sort of situation until these moments of human kindness started to crop up, you know, like people would come up to me, these kids, they would look and they would just be like, oh. and then, or, or it's, you know, um, in Em's Han, when refugees came up to me and this one man said, I'm sorry, I don't speak um, German, but I have to say that when you started to sing, it went straight to my heart and and then an older man came with gloves from the one Euro shop and handed them over to me and said, it was freezing because I decided to do this one. It started getting really cold outside. <laughs> so he said, if you cut the fingertips off, maybe you'll be a little bit warmer. And then in It's a Ho, I'm standing on the street and there's a guy looking at me with a typical, like I'm ready for him to like come over and sign a ticket for me playing there. You know what I mean? He was really giving me the evil look. And then he's giving me the evil look from this side too. And I'm like, if you don't like the music, just leave, like stop giving me the mean look. But then when I finished one song, he came over to me and he goes, I didn't know if you drank coffee. So I bought you a raspberry tea. I assure you, I have so many great stories from this A to Z. And I have so many moments of where I push myself outside of, you know, outside of the comfort zone, you know, really. Yeah, so raspberry tea, comfort zone, uh they're all songs and you yeah. from the a to z you created new songs not only did you already have songs but it, it's a fabulous journey it's an experience but you really left the comfort zone to do that and when you did you realized that you put on your pants just like everybody else you can connect in human ways with other people that you, you're just trying to come together to find a better operating system, find a, a little bit more humanity uh, with the world. I, I actually even wanted to go deeper because there's this almost, and I, and I please forgive me, I'm not sure if this is the right, there's this imposter 
syndrome or feeling that some people to have when they're talking around politicians or scientists or whatever they're like what gives me the right to everybody has a right to speak about the basic needs of humanity food water air security of body security of where you live and, and, and those are basic human rights and there is no instruction manual when we're born uh, and there is no certification course when we're born to be able to speak about those things. Uh, um, those were all made by some human, some man, some woman somewhere to give instruction or give someone a degree. Uh, we do it every single day. We deal with these things every single day and it's just part of life. And there's this, I guess there is a rule, uh, um, probably one of the oldest historical rules in our world, and it's the golden rule, treat people and planet how you would like to be treated. And if you do it with that good Samaritan, that good intent in mind, there's very little you can do, do wrong. Um, you may not have received a, a degree in food or in climate or in the environment and not be a scientist, but you do have experience. You went to Urban Crop Solutions and spent almost a week, a couple days there getting training on vertical farming, on closed environmental agriculture, on different methods and types. I, I want you to tell me if that was an eye opener, what you learned, what that experience was like and where it was. And if you had an adventure there as well, I want to hear about it. Oh my gosh, it's a small town in Belgium, right? It's, uh, I don't know. Really it's a UNESCO historical site in Belgium, matter of fact. Like, I don't retain all information. I, I very seldomly retain places I've been, but, you know, um, I've been uh, to a lot of places. I mean, even Montenegro now that I was thinking about, I was like, oh my gosh, I love Montenegro. That was so fun. Um, anyway, um, I think that the, the great thing about the training at Urban Crop Solution was actually. Um, I mean, being hands-on and seeing the technology and learning really on a deeper level. I mean, I, I've read a million things about vertical farming. You know, I've been following AeroFarm since the beginning, you know, and, and all of the players actually. I mean, we were down in Austria at the Vertical Farm Conference. Skyberries. Yeah, the Skyberries. And um, I just, uh, I feel that, uh, you know, Urban Crop Solutions really was a, a, a deeper eye opener into the actual process itself, but also in the fact that they are more interested in being the state of the art um, vertical farming. That means like, say the Mercedes, you know, so they're, they're really going for the longevity and resilience. And, and they're also doing a lot of research into the R&D section of it, of what other plants and uh, crops we can grow. And I think that that it, it's an, it's incredibly exciting. I mean, even now the whole front with berries, you know, that we're going beyond salads that, um, and, and even, I, I mean, what we talk about vertical farming forever, these plant recipes, you know, the fact that, you know, I have a tiny little vertical farm in my closet and just this, this, the, the fact that I'm having it and the connection that I have to, there's a seed, there's cocoa peat, there's water and there's light. So it's getting its nutrients. It has this recipe. And there it just starts to grow. And I can watch this growing process. And I, I'm sorry, every single time I'm fascinated and every single time I'm excited about it. And I think the, the world should be excited about that. You know, I think that we need to get this into schools. I mean, we had, you know, we were talking about this idea of having a container traveling from school to school through different life cycles. Why? Because it's exciting. Because children will be excited about it then they can take their crops home to their parents who'll be like, wow, that's so great. It's beyond organic, it's super nutritional. And it was grown without less, you know, um, impact to the environment because we have to combine these systems. We don't have enough land. We can't, we can't be just using all of our land only for farming. We have to come up with different ways to do it in an urban agricultural way, right, Mark? Exactly. Right? I mean, you, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to release some of your secrets. So, you actually started with a. a, a you were pretty excited uh, when IKEA came out with their little uh, kind of home vertical farm type of thing and then you're like ah oh, it's so hard to put together it doesn't doesn't really work it's not a closed system and then the the one that you were talking about 
was the click and grow and you've had that but you've also had some lessons to learn from click and grow some fungus issues some bug issues so what they call uh fungal gnats and and even maybe fruit flies from some of the growth so there's been some learning lessons but overall your experience your knowledge on on how you see those living beings and how they grow, how it can be hydroponic, what the difference between soil-based and full hydroponic is. You Along this journey, not only did you learn on the commercial scale from Urban Crop Solutions on kind of closed systems and that, um, you, you've also looked and heard about aquaponics and many different types of types of processes where you've taken that journey and made yourself aware of what's in the market and and follow those. And earlier you mentioned Kimball Musk and most people might might not get that. Kimball Musk is Elon Musk's brother. He's big in farm. He does um, uh, uh, also a container solution um, for growing um, plants and, and it's not a closed system, but it's in a container and it's that, but there's no um, uh, use of non-finite resources, renewable energy and HVAC. So it's kind of intensive on, on how that works, but it's a new system and it works pretty good for urban, urban um, situations. But we're always asking ourselves, why isn't this 100%? And just this year, um, and, and last year it was beginning to emerge, but because of the pandemic, there's been some fabulous things that have happened in this area. So one, the USDA is certified hydroponics as, as being able to be qualified as organics, which was before a no-no. So if it wasn't grown in soil, I, you couldn't call it organic. And so we, we used to say it's actually beyond organic. The minerals, vitamins, and nutrients are actually a little bit better um, if you have a closed system, there's no pest, no pesticides, no chemicals, there's different things. So that's a, that's a huge milestone or achievement that was made in the U.S. Um, but the other thing is Urban Crop Solutions, who, who you went and received that training and experience from, they're getting ready to roll out um, through, through our contact there is Brecht Stube, who you like and uh, I think uh, is, is, is our buddy. But he uh, and Urban Crops signed a partnership with IKEA, and they did a bunch of tests and, and um, with IKEA on on some of their systems, on some of their containers, and now IKEA is getting ready to roll out in all their stores this big, huge offering of multiple containers, complete solutions for city growth, for home growth, for for di different options around producing food, and. I guess, I don't know if you've learned this or not, but growing your own food is like printing your own money. It's, it's a form of resilience. It's a form of stability and not only that connection, but you, you don't have that panic and angst. Where am I going to get my toilet paper from? Where am I going to get my food from? Because you're like, oh, I can just grow it myself. I, I grow my own food here uh, uh, at the house as well. I do sprouting, but I also got lemon trees. I got lime trees, I got clementines. I've got, you know, and, and before we really got into the deep dive, like I showed at the beginning, yeah. you gave me this as a gift, but you had these in your home already. So you already were thinking closed systems, systems thinking this is, this is a closed system. Of, of producing and very little inputs, but yet it still thrives. It still survives. It's beautiful. And um, I, I just, I just love these journeys. And I think you, you're, you're, you're verging on the form of being either a pretty darn good urban farmer, or you're getting well, close to the farmer. There's no doubt about it. I, I think I'm really bad, but I have so much respect for them. I think that's, that's what you gain by actually growing your own things because you see how hard it is. I mean, even with your own plants in your, in your own house and you know, also these lessons along the way, just nature itself, like the secret life of trees, you know, the, the, the idea of, and I'm sorry, but I'm like one of the biggest fans of fungi and mycelium because like once you start going down underground and starting to understand how the whole systems work, how the, the sort of a network of communication going on with nature and mushrooms and all living things in the forest, you can never ever walk by a tree in the city 
and not think about how amazing it is once you've you know, when you sort of peek behind those doors. And I think that's what it's about. It's, you know, we can't necessarily all be farmers, but what we can do is respect farmers. I, I, I mean, through my journey, I have to say respect for teachers is so high on my list. Teachers, the job that they're doing is, you know, I only have respect. And then now with this, this new era of, of these pioneer farmers who are out there trying to change the systems, because they understand and they actually wanna do good for nature, but they're stuck in an old system because of political subsidies and you know they, they don't really know how to break out. And yet there are these crazy other pioneering people like you know, soul food forest farms that are like, hey, we'll come, we'll help you, we'll consult, we'll do one hectare of your land. And then you're gonna, you know, you're gonna give back to the biodiversity. We're gonna study everything that's going on in the soil, around the soil, the microbes. You just, there's so much we don't see. There's so much we don't understand. And so the more we research and look into it, the more amazing we can, the more amazed we can be. Not, you know, we, it, I'm amazed. I love yeah, you. I, 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 I am too. And and I mean, just, just as we talk, I mean, more things are like, boy, we've had some amazing journeys. We've had some amazing experiences. Um, the, probably one of the last big ones we had is we were both in Madrid at the COP25. Yeah, yeah, COP25 in Madrid for the Conference of the Parties, which is the UNF Triple C's United Nations Climate Conference. Um, we we kind of go as as tag team partners where we're uh, trying to divide and conquer. We spoke, we both spoke and uh, at Equal which you also mentioned. Uh, we had in the COP on the floor and in the pavilions, uh, different meetings, different events, um, just wonderful experiences. Although there was also some frustration and craziness uh, involved in that. And when you're in the, the throes of things, it's like, oh my goodness, are we ever gonna make it? This is frustrating. But, but we've truly really had some, some great experiences. And that kind of reminds me as well, Last year, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, says, you know, we're going to do the United Nations Food Systems Summit. It's going to be in, in uh, June in, in Rome, Italy, as a pre-summit, and then again in, in New York in September. Um, and then we're going to go to Glasgow and have a, have a pavilion, a booth, and kind of talk more about that. David Nabarro, the, the, the event you just did, was uh, FSS, how, what, how do, what's the acronym, FFA? FFA, the Farm for the Future of Agriculture and Environment. Farm yeah. for the Future of Agriculture with FAO and, and people from the UN, it's all about, it's amazing, but uh, we, we just had this journey and you're kind of getting the big complexity on a global level now, you're seeing seeing all these things. And I've always been in, in our, business plans for the Loja Seco Center and things, I'll always kind of try to throw the SDGs in there and, and show this. Uh, and, and that really brings me to, to I guess, the hardest question um, I have for you, not, not only those experiences, is in, in my life, I always like, what's the meaning of life? What's the purpose? What's the goal? Where's the plan? Where are we going with this? And, and for, for me, uh, uh, I think, you know, I, I, I have a pretty strong dogma and a vision of the, of the future, but I believe that the sustainable de development goals are a roadmap and a plan. The first ever global moonshot for the future is kind of a really great ambition to, to get us there and some targets and in indicators of money. The question is the burning question, WTF, <laughs> what's the future? Although we said the other one, what's the future and kind of what's, you know, what's your plan or what's your vision of the future? Where are we going? What, what do we need to do from your, from your point? I don't want to know anyone else's point. Um, uh, I mean, if we go back to this, you know, the COP25 where, where we, uh, we had some great experiences, I think, uh, again, you know, there's so many there's so many really important turning points in everyone's life, you know, and um, it was another one for me there, uh, 
with this food systems dialogues with David Navarro. Again, it was another table where I thought, what am I doing here? You know, but then because they were actually looking for solutions. It wasn't just a room where he was going to talk about things. He was like, you're going to get together with these different groups and you're going to, you know, you're going to make notes. And within this half an hour, your group is going to come up with solutions. And I, and the people that were in my group were so amazing. The woman that, you know, we, we just started this discussion and I realized actually already after only being involved in this for a couple of years that I had a lot of input and I had a lot of visions of what we could possibly do. And, and I'm incredibly enthusiastic about it. So I feel that as awful as the pandemic has been and as awful as this last, um, you know, the, the history of sort of fake news and people turning on each other and not trying to understand each other, I still feel it, within this green energy movement, there's so much going on. And I feel that there's so many more people who are willing to, to join the green energy movement um, and that they're really looking for solutions. You've noticed it yourself, you're getting a million calls from a million big players, big industry where we've been trying to help industry and startups sort of connect. Like how can we, how can we bring what we know in the sustainability world together with what already exists without trying to be disruptive and, but to, to slowly make changes. And I think that that um, there are people really working on making this happen. Um, I saw it again in this uh, FFA uh, forum that I, that I was in listening to the people talk there, maybe the same players and David Navarro and the WWF and the, you know, all these great guys, but we're making real strides and the rest of the world is kind of a little more open to listening to those things, whereas before they just Oh, no, I've got my own problems. I'm, you know, whatever. I'm working hard. I'm going on my vacation. I, you know, I can't deal with it. Everyone's somehow now open and ready. I mean, even again with my, uh, you know, joining the uh, Chamber of Commerce in Hamburg, I, you know, went in and here I am again in a room of like, Dr. PhD, I am the CEO. And, and I'm like, I'm the last person to introduce myself in this group of like amazing people. I'm thinking, oh no, but I assure you, I just came straight out with, hey, uh, we're not talking enough about sustainability. We need, Hamburg needs to become uh, a lighthouse project with some great innovative ideas because Germans are so ridiculously brilliant. We have engineers, we have technologists, we have research institutes, we have so everything we have here. We can already do this in our city and we can share it with other cities. And why aren't we doing it? I, I just don't, I don't go for like, oh, well, it's a lot of work and <gasps> Hamburg isn't really known for that. Forget that. That's the way it was. We have new models, we have new doors and we have new highways. And I'm telling you, God, I have the most amazing team. I really do. I have such amazing people on this team with me and I annoy them all the time. <laughs> They thought it was gonna be like, oh, she's just American. She's just gonna say something and then she's gonna be done. Ha ha, funny. Ha, no. <laughs> we're really, we're doing great things. Yeah, you are. And it is a fabulous team and, and, and it's, it's still developing, but I see some, some bright hope. The, the big thing that, that many people um, have a trouble grasping is one, the, the systems thinking, but the, 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 the bigness of this, this, the true sheer size. So we, even from, from the Hamburg point of view and what you're trying to do and get going here in Hamburg, what a lot of people um, struggle with is they realize even if we were to do the Hamburg um, system here, we're still only kind of tickling the surface of the problem of, of where we need to go in the future. And, and, and that, 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 that really, if we, we did multiple of these around, then we would start to, to make a dent. And, and that's this, this progress. Please go ahead. This is the thing. The coolest part about what it is, is that together with my, my um, you know, I've been working with Project Together and they are this open social innovation hub. They have the Farm Food Climate Challenge. And I just jumped in there and I'm like, okay, people, and who are you? And what do you have and initiatives? And all of the great energy with them. And I have some other people also in Berlin. The idea that we're doing here for Hamburg, we're actually doing for all of Germany. 
And that's why this connection to Project Together, because they have uh, connected politically and they have a hundred mayors all over Germany that are looking for ideas, for, for ways to change the systems, for ways to do urban agriculture in the city, uh, you know, in their cities. And also, again, with this, uh, you know, this, this, this farming, farming outside of the city. So what we're doing, even though I'm trying to say, okay, I'm here, I have this team here, we're actually doing this for all of Germany, all of Europe, and really beyond the borders, because we we have the we have the the technology and the education and the people here to do it but the idea is to share this with everybody outside of the world even those places that are going to have real problems with their water resources a lot sooner than we are you know we need to develop this this concept here so that they know what to do they don't have to put the time and effort in we're sharing it's open you know yeah and, and i love that and i see that where I was, uh, and I, I, I hope that, that it will spread to the mayors. I have a lot of optimism that it will. The, I guess kind of where I was going was, and you heard me speak about this at Skyberries when we were, Skyberries was an Austrian, that's a big event for all sorts of vertical farm, aquaponics, hydroponics um, line of thinking. So new forms of urban culture, uh, urban agriculture. And all the there there at that time there was probably around 1200 to 1400 different vertical farms and aquaponics and hydroponics uh, facilities around the world and really if if you know the population of the world you know what market they can address they're only not even really tickling the surface of the problem to be part of the solution to become to address the, uh, that facet uh, of the system and that problem, we could actually have 100,000 or a million such setups around the world. And then we would start to make a dent and, and help support the, the complex food systems um, with a new alternative that is future proof, that is resilient, that is not based on different type of fuels, different type of energy, use um, one that is much more regenerative much more longer term and so that that's a uh, initially when we speak to people about these projects they're like oh this is big this is complex it's really not it's about the size of you know one metro grocery store for us here in in, in europe you know kind of a shopping uh, cash and carry location it's about the size of um you know, in, in the United States, a Costco type of, type of a thing, you, you do a setup like that. And um, there's only, even if you were producing 24 seven in such a system, there's only so much market you can reach in order to be a true solution. We need hundreds of thousands of such solutions. And so really the thing we deal with is for people to see that scale, the grandeur of what it could really do to change our food systems and the infrastructure for better ways of, of doing things are another tool for the toolbox that really is as supportive and helpful. And that's kind of where I was going and what I meant with that. I kind of think that um, it's grown beyond vertical farming for tools in the toolbox now, because um, now that we've really, uh, we started to understand our industrial, uh, uh, you know, agriculture, the farming, the animals and what, what kind of, um, that, that we just we simply cannot continue to have a meat production system to feed our growing population. It's it, it's absolutely not possible. And this the cultivated meat future and how we can actually I mean just the scope of the fact that with a bioreactor in 40 days we can produce enough meat okay for a city that would be equivalent to taking something like 30, no, 28 to 30 months. Do you know the numbers of this? Of like two years of cows growing for us to get the same amount of meat within 40 days in a city, okay? You, the, you, the, the future of, of meat, our meat consumption is gonna change. The fact that our, we've got these plant-based meat alternatives that also are, are out there. The fact that we have this precision fermentation, what we're doing with mycelium, you know, we're gonna have new products, we're gonna have new foods, alternative proteins, also this great thing with fish, 
we literally, we cannot fish our oceans the way we are anymore. We have the possibility of making cultivated fish. It's gonna be out by the end of the year, you know? So we have fish products for our, where we don't have to, you know, completely deplete our oceans of all the fish. We can't continue with, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, business as usual. There is no way. So there are many tools for this toolbox and we just have to, we have to get the box going, right? I agree, that's so beautiful. Um, normally in the beginning, I ask the question, um, are you a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without nations and borders and humanity divided one from another? I, I believe I know. So you're from uh, Long Island, New York. You've lived in Germany most of your life. And because of your fabulous husband, Demir, and many other good reasons to raise your kids at international schools and, and uh, who have now gone on to be very successful, beautiful adults. Um, but I, I wanna kind of get your views and opinions because you worked around the world. You've sang in Namibia and with the kids and you've done different projects, but I wanna hear how you feel about this. Uh, of the global citizen thing. I, you know, my favorite thing, people get so annoyed with me, but I'm like, basically we're all just parasites. Like I always love this, this, this vision from above, you know, God looking down and we're all these tiny little things moving around like, oh, what are we doing? Like, uh, you know, we think we're so super important, but there are millions of things like dancing around. Um, I have been fortunate enough to, to have, you know, bopped around in different places in the world, which, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's been a luxury, I have to say. And uh, even though I was uh, at the beginning when I was living in Germany, I, I had a really hard time because, m mostly because I, um, I love my family and I just, I just miss them so much. I didn't really wanna have a life so far away from them. Um, but in hindsight, um, it's, I, I've learned it's better to accept your situation than to spend your time, you know, thinking about why you would rather be somewhere else. You know, this grass is greener type thing. I just, I spent a lot of years thinking, oh, I would much rather, you know, have Sunday dinner with my parents. And it was just a waste of time. You know, I was having Sunday to do here. Why not like invest here? And even with, with the pandemic, like, oh, well, yeah, I sure would love to go out to a restaurant with my friends. Well, Okay, so I'm just walking around the Ulster with my friends. I still, you know, like I, I, I think that um, the, it's, it's how you look at the glass half empty, glass half full, really. And uh, basically I got about like 7,000, maybe 8,000 days to go, maybe more because my grandmother made it to 101. I don't know, but you know, that's it. I, what am I gonna do with those days? You know, sit there and go, oh, well, I wish I could go out of my house. <laughs> no, I'm in my house so I can read. I can write a song. That, that, gonna... That's a John P. Strelecki, Purpose for Existing, PFE yeah. and Big Five for Life. He also talks about those days that we have on this earth and what are you doing with those days? So I love that. Um, I, I was kind of more getting, do you believe that our regional civilization frameworks are working for us all? And maybe do we need a, a global new operating system, a new that, you know, I caveated it with the yeah, SDGs 12, a little yeah. bit further back. I do think that there it will be a shift. And I, I mean, I feel that we are, I feel that so many people are not on board with that idea. And so many people are grasping for um, their own cultures and, and, and what they know and not sort of opening themselves up to others. Since I have been, um, through my life experience, lived in different cultures. I lived in Italy, I lived in Paris, I have Croatian family, my father's Hungary, I have, you know, what I mean, and I've lived in Germany. So I've really um, actually experienced other cultures and there are differences. I think that when we met, it was, again, we just, we have this link we have this link in foods that we like to eat. We have this link in music that we like to hear. And, and also in this insane optimism and energy into wanting to make changes, you know? We don't sit there and go, um, yeah, Abba. You know, we don't sit there like, well, this hmm, might not work. We're like, how is this gonna work? 
wait, let, let's find the resources, let's find the tools, you know? And I think it, it, it has something to do with where we came from and the way, you know, um, we, uh, the culture that we were in. And so I, I, I believe and I hope that there will be global citizens and because I'm accepting, I hope, even though like you think like, am I accepting of everybody? I don't know, the killers and the rapists. I don't think pedophiles, not such friends of mine, but you know, I still believe uh, in a global world, absolutely in a global system. Look at the, you know, look at the earth from above, really. How can you yeah, not? We, we got disconnected somehow with one another on, on um, we're all distant cousins. We're all star stuff. We're all stardust. We all crawled out of the primordial soup. And yeah, I was born from my mother's womb uh, and um, kind of crawled out of Mother Earth in, in that respect. But um, we're, we're all related to each other. We're distant cousins. But yeah, there's, you know, not only uh, Black Lives Matter and so many other cultural, racial issues going on at this time. We, you know, I, I always, I, I love John Lennon, go back to a song, Imagine, and, and, and how, how we can come together. I think that because our world with technology, because the ease of, of travel, you know, when we're not in pandemics, that it's a much smaller, more connected world that we can get information around the world, but that we need to figure out a way to operate, um, have a different operating system or operate together a little bit better and that's why I wanted to kind of get your your views on that. And 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 uh, I, you know, we've had many discussions like this over the past because it's all. Uh, uh, no matter where we talk about what we do, there's always people who are at a different level, and they're not. They're our cousins. They're related to us. We're we're close to them. But there's a different point that we have to pick them up from that level and get them to another, or take them on a journey. And some. Some might not be ready or not, might not be there. When, you know, 20 plus years ago, I wasn't ready. I was an overweight, crazy guy. I was desensitized. I was numb. I couldn't feel the world. I, if you were to talk to me about sustainability or whatever, I couldn't hear it. I couldn't feel it because I was in a different situation. And so there's, no matter what, we've talked about stories and journeys and experiences it's a transition that we all need to make as some of us are there and ready. And those are the calls that we've been receiving uh, this year, but others of us, the, we don't want to forget them or cast them aside. We need to figure out how to reach them, whether it's a, a, an emotional or it's a visual or it's audible or somehow to help them. And, and one thing that I have learned which has been, well, a couple of things that I've learned over, over the times so that's real, um, for me, almost hard learning lessons is that uh, it takes about four to five times of some, some people hearing the same message over and over again before they can even hear it or understand it because of their life situation of wherever, wherever they're at. And uh, the other one is that we're all at different levels of evolution and we need to pick up people where they're at and, and give them the tools of empowerment to get to a better place. Because in general, what we're talking about is only a better system, uh, a future proof system, a better operating model for us to, to, to get much further along generationally into the future to more resilient, desirable, regenerative futures and that's really the the big hope. I mean, I don't know if I, I or you will will see a lot of of this, but I really want to create this better world, this better operating system for people where they can be hopeful and optimistic. I mean, this the thing that I I feel is that you know you first of all, there's so much information out there, okay, but since I focus really in this one world, okay, that, uh, that has opened itself up to me, and I still don't even, I can't even begin to fathom all of the complexity of our food system when it comes to production, transport, distribution, uh, you know, waste, all of this, it, it is so complex, but I just keep putting my time and energy into trying to understand it and seeing what's out there. And, and, um, and then sharing that knowledge with, with other people because I've invested more time than just read one article, 
okay? A lot of people just say, get their news and then they shut it off and that's just what they think. And the thing is, so many of those people are out there working so hard. I mean, even in some research that I did, the thought when I go into Aldi and I see in a can that there's a Schweinehaxe, a whole meal for one euro 50. And you think about where did that come from? The, you know, the, the entire production system behind that. But the person who bought that doesn't have time to think, oh, well, this might not be good for the environment. They worked all day. They're exhausted. They have kids to feed. They just want to get to bed. And so they take this can. Now, the thing that, that I feel that what we need to do to make a change is to, to offer them a better product so that when they go in there, they can feel better about themselves. The fact that people are going to unfortunately have to pay a little bit more money for a certain type of food because there has to be a price on what it does to the environment. You cannot just be producing and, and treating animals this way, it just cannot continue with the way that we've had it up until now. But those people who are out there fighting just to make a living, just to pay their bills, we need to offer them products that are, that are gonna make them feel also better inside. Without that, they have to spend all this time researching, how do we do it? What's the transfer? What's the distribution? They don't have time for that. What they need is people like us to change the system. For the industries to say, okay, I mean, great, Friday's future, go out, scream, so that industries make a shift. All of us are doing our part, and we're doing it together to, to simply reform the system. You know, we have to. Yeah, so the, the, you touched upon two things, and you also touched upon it earlier. One, it's really the true cost, the total environmental cost, the natural capital, the the resources and that we need to start paying that we we're in a deficit we're taking more than we we can use in a year that can be regenerated and then the second one that you mentioned earlier and I, and we need to repeat it because i'm not sure a, a lot of people get it right in the beginning is it's not about the products of the future it's about how we produce and that occurs in the and from the farm to the production methods on how we produce that product that when it gets to the stores, when it gets to the consumers, that the, those who don't have, who've just got off a 12 hour shift or an eight hour shift and have kids to feed or, or are trying to make ends meet. And because the bigger system of life, wherever they live, they're not making enough wages or whatever it is, they don't have time to read the labels. They're just hungry. They just want to eat. They want to get to sleep, to eat and get to sleep or, or, or veg out, so to say, so that they can start the whole process over again tomorrow. And they're not going to look at the label. They're going to look at, can I afford that? Will it feed my family and get us to tomorrow? And uh, it, it, that's where we need to change the way we produce, the way we put those inputs and in, in, in that it doesn't harm human health and our environment in, in the process. And that's that bigger picture that... Uh, you you said it, but I want I want to emphasize it because it's so <laughs> vital. Uh, it's so vital. Um, we I, I don't know if you want to get into some of my other other deeper questions. You know, um, uh, whatever. I, I, we have so much fun talking. <laughs> we we could talk forever. Actually, I I think I, I think we covered some really hot topics, and and I. I before I ask you my final last three questions, which are really for my listeners, kind of things that can help and improve them, I want to ask you, is there anything that we didn't get to talk about that's vital that people who are, are listening that they know that that you're you're frustrated that I didn't bring out or mention? Oh, I don't know. I I um I don't know. We talked about a lot of, of good things. I don't I don't know. Okay, great. So the last three questions are if there was one message you could depart to my listeners that um, as a sustainable takeaway for them to apply into their lives that has the power to change their life. What would it be your message? Uh, whew, I think, um, I think my, my message is uh, uh, hopefully by way of inspiration and enthusiasm to leave the comfort zone. Just whatever it might be, whatever that thing in your life that you think oh, I would love to do it do it because it's um 
it's just, yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely worth it. <laughs> Whatever yeah, it is. It's another twist as well as on like Brene Brown, uh, the vulnerability. As yeah. you leave that comfort zone, as you're vulnerable, as you do those things, it's actually in many respects turns into a superpower. There's so many amazing things that occur from that. I love that. That's a, a fabulous. What should young singer, songwriters, innovators in, in your area now merging into food and, and, and that be thinking about or looking for ways to make real impact to, to start where they're at, but to have some impact? Oh, okay, it's kind of two different worlds. Um, whenever I, um, obviously, uh, as you said, I have two kids and uh, my two children are very different personalities to each other, but what I tell them and their friends and, and anybody else that I come, uh, come along, you, you have to, you know, be who that authentic voice is inside of yourself, even, you know, and you sort of shut off the doubt guy and just go with like what your heart is saying and, and follow that bliss. I mean, it, it's the most rewarding and the most frustrating, you know, um, in, in hindsight, I always sort of went off the beaten path and I definitely didn't realize that going off the beaten path was going to be the most fulfilling. Um, so just believe in that. It's, I always, I mean, I have millions of songs about this too. It's kind of like a whisper, but if you listen, then, then that's going to be the thing that's going to fill up your heart the most in this short life that you have, you know? I love it. What have you experienced or learned so far in your journey um, that you would lo have loved to know from the start? Oh, geez. Um, I would have, uh, hmm. I, I, I definitely, uh, I, it's that thing about accepting your fate. I think that that, I wish I just didn't fight so much. I wish I didn't fight so much about the fact that, wow, I'm living in a different country, in a different culture, I can't speak the language, um, and just just went more with it. You know, I think uh, that comes with age. Definitely not the fighting and everything being so, you know, it's where you put your focus, you know? I love it. Ava, you're, you're my bestie. I, I love you. And I'm so <laughs> glad we- you, Mark, we can save the world today. <laughs> of course, we're going to save the world every day. Every day we get up and, and um, try to have some good impact, live, you know, kind of like the- Steve Jobs that live every day as if it were your last uh, in some respects. I, I I truly believe we do that. And I'm so glad that we're friends and that we will continue this and that we were able to have this discussion and give some insight to um, my listeners. And, and uh, by the way, Ava is the one who's created the thumbnails and helped it, even though it's transformed and I've mutated them a little bit more with more craziness, but she's, she's always helping me. She's such a creative in many different directions. She's, we didn't even get a talk that you've actually written two songs for me. I, I need to use them. I need to uh, apply them more. Um, so I have a lot more learnings and experiences together that we, that we'll make, but um, thank you so much for being on the podcast and we were, we were going to do this again. Wait, I have to thank you. Can I, can I thank sure. you? Go ahead. I have to thank you for opening up the doorways and the pathways and the roads and the rainbows and the sunshine that uh, that I've been able to travel down with you and all that I've been able to learn. It's given my life also such a, um, yeah, such a deeper meaning, you know, and, uh, and it's, it, again, even forget the pushing me out of the comfort zone, it's inspired me. I've been inspired to do so much on presentations and websites and, you know, basically trying to get the message out the, in the way that I can, uh, it sort of goes through me and then comes out and, and hopefully we just together reach more people in a good positive light, you know, the green energy work.
You're, you're so, absolutely. Oh, and also thank you for doing this podcast and speaking to people and all that you do with your books and all that you do with your speaking engagements and the fact that you never stop. The fact that you are like a sponge and I call you like, I say, oh, Mark, I need a little bit more into, you know, I need this information. And then you just start shooting out millions of uh, connections for me. Uh, I just, there's so many ways I can thank you for what you do. But um, I, I do it because I love you and I believe in it. And uh, um, I, I'm so thank you. Thank you for thanking me. But you're so welcome. It's been a sheer pleasure. And I, uh, I, I always try to share my crazy brain and thoughts in whatever way I can help with you in any way. Um, I mean, just th that alone opened up so many things. I remember we had coffee where you're like, should I do the climate reality leadership training? What is it like? And and then you went and it was a good experience. And then you came back and there was this, this time where you're like, how do I make it mine? How do I, because that's a great thing about Al Gore. He empowers you. He says, don't, don't give my talk word for word. Take it. I give you all the tools. I empower you. You make it your own. Delete slides, add new ones, make it personal. And you jumped on that and out of all the people who receive his training there's a small percentage who actually do that and then actually give the presentations and you did that and then you went on to be a mentor but the last thing is as i close is after that you did your own climate conferences just through that journey you've reached thousands of people speaking to them online offline doing your own climate conferences climate events in Berlin at the Brandenburg tour, all over the world, not just Montenegro. Uh, and it's amazing because that's this, whoops, that's this ripple effect that happens in our world. When you help and empower others, when, when you get this bug of passion that you've got to spread it on, you've got to pass it on. And it just, I, I love what you've done. And I know you're not done, you're still going strong, but thank you work to do. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ava. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.